Well, uh, probably the most exciting story I have in my own mind is uh, when I dra was drafted, I got a draft card that said to be in Pittsburgh at a certain date at a certain time and uh, uh, to have an overnight bag. So if I had to stay over, I had uh, my uh, shaving. Expecting to, uh, they normally do physical and tests and things like that. Well, at the end of the uh, test and the physical and everything, they marched us into a room and swore us in and they said, uh, you're headed for uh, Fort Jackson. When you get up in the morning, you'll be at Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, <laughs> this is a shocker. <laughs> so they, uh, Obviously, I got on the phone and uh, called people saying, you know, I'm not coming home. <laughs> I'm Cindy Hildebrand owner of Cindy's Place. I've uh, been here since 2000. It's a family, family friendly restaurant that everybody comes to. Um, a lot of our uh, veterans come here, um, which you'll see on the video. I, I first started out wanting to do this for my husband. He so badly wanted to go into the service, but he uh, gave up so he wasn't able to go. So his dream in his life has been the military, constantly reading about it and learning about it, asking all the older gentlemen their history. And I thought this would be a nice way for him to remember this. And then to turn around, that this, our son goes to the Air Force also, and that made it even more of a desire to do this. I really, I was involved with it before Brent, um, and I have deep respect for anybody that's been in the military. So uh, I think that uh, with both of us together, it just really, was a little bit of a deeper thought in feeling to do this. If we continue it, I would like to, um, I would like it to make a little bit of a learning history for a lot of the younger generations to learn about what, what happened, how we got to where we are now, and what they can do to make things better. You're having a sausage, to be honest. I'm like, yeah. okay, okay. I'm just just to make sure that it looks good so far. So. Okay, okay, sausage, baby. Thank you. That sounds great. Okay. What was your name, sir? Ted Walker. Ted Walker? And how old are you, sir? 81. 81's the new 50 nowadays. Yeah, it's good. It slowed me down some, but uh, uh, knock on wood, I'm still able to take care of myself. My one aunt's right now, she's 90. That's the only aunt I have. They're all gone. My uncle was 94 when he died. Mm -hmm. well, well, I guess we can really start from the beginning. You served in the Army in Germany for 18 months. And what year was that, sir? 61, I'm pretty sure. 1961. I, I married 21 days. <laughs> married for 21 days? <laughs> they shipped me out. <laughs> and you had to go. How old were you then? Were you... I was 22. You were drafted? Yeah. I tried to get in the Navy. I can't hear on my right ear. Really? They, they wouldn't take me. They wouldn't take you in. I told the Army that. He read over and touched me. He said, you're still warm. You're going to go. And they took you fine. Yeah, they took me. <laughs> I had that operation in this year. Mm -hmm. I had a mastoid in a growth operation. It left me death. Right, left ear, 
get an aid in there, but it helps out some, but it... And they just hacked it off, and like, oh... Oh, I, I can hear, like, one-on-one, mm -hmm. but if there's been half a dozen people in here, I'd have a hard time. But I'm thankful. Then, four years ago, I had to have open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. 11 days after that, I had a mini stroke. It affected my speech, but still happy. <laughs> my granddaughter, she spent the whole day whenever I was in there, and I get out, and she said I could cry, and I hear Pappy trying to talk. I said, no, you'd be happy that I'm still here. Yeah. It, it, some, sometimes it's really bad if I get nervous. I can hardly talk. <laughs> Mostly when women, I'm talking to a woman, that's when it bothers me the most. Why, I have no idea. But I'm grateful that I'm still here. Now you were in Germany for 18 months, you 18 said. 18 months. I was in Stuttgart. Now during that time, that was a consecutive 18 months. You never went home during that time. No. And you were just married. Yeah, just married 21 days. Oh, we did pretty good. You have your battles, but we stuck it out. The preacher married us. He said, you'll never make it. Him being in the service, you'll never make it. Showed him, didn't you? Yeah, I saw him well before he died there. I said, do you remember what you told me a long time ago? And he said, what? He said that we'd never make it together. We're still together. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, that's great. Well, during your time in Germany for 18 months, what were you operating as with the Army? I was operating the engineers. You were the engineers? Quartermaster. Then? We supplied the 7th Army. I got my ears frostbitten over there. We were not on a maneuver. Supposed to be out there two weeks. He's out there three months. It, it, Germany looks a lot like Pennsylvania. There are hills and stuff like that. The only thing I know is different, the barns right up next to the house. Really? The house, it's all one piece. My cousin was in the Korean War and he went back a couple years ago. They will, he gave him his old army uniform like that there. He said, they, they still hold a lot of grudge, but he was under protection all the time. They flew him back over to Korea. I think he's 92, 93 now. He's still loving him. He talks about that. He said, boy, that was a good experience going back and see that place again. Like us, we was there in the worst time. Mm -hmm. They bombed. Of course, I was in peacetime ever in Germany. Them bombing places and half of my crew went to Vietnam and the other half went to Germany. Mm -hmm. I was well, lucky I went to Germany. Okay, my name's David Curran. That last name is spelled C-U-R-R-A-N. Okay, I entered the Navy on the 16th of June, 1964, two weeks after I graduated from high school. I, went, I was 17 at the time. I went in on what they uh, call, referred to as a kiddie cruise. I was supposed to get out the day before my 21st birthday, which for me would have been approximately three and a half years. 
But that three and a half years uh, ended up being a 20 year career instead. Uh, I went through basic training at uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, the first ship that I was on was the USS Arneb, AKA 56. It was home port in Norfolk, Virginia. Been there. Uh, I was on that ship for approximately six months and I went to Engine A school at Great Lakes. And after I finished Engine school, I went to the staff of the commander of the South Atlantic Force in Trinidad. I was barge engineer on the Admiral's personnel boat. Mm. After that tour of duty was up, I went to the USS Oglethorpe, AKA 100, home port in Norfolk, Virginia. And it was while I was on the Oglethorpe that I re-enlisted for the first time. Uh, I left the, when I left the Oglethorpe, uh, I went to Engineman C School at Great Lakes. And uh, after I completed Engineman C School, I went on tugboats at, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and NAD Earl, New Jersey. NAD Earl is the Naval Ammunition Depot. Naval Ammunition Depot in New Jersey. After my tour of duty there was up, I went to the West Coast, and I was on the USS Constant, MSO 427. Uh, the Constant was an ocean-going minesweeper. Uh, it was made out of wood. Wooden ships and iron men is what they referred to us as. Uh, I made my first West Pack on the Constant. Uh, we worked off the coast of South Vietnam, uh, mine hunting, and also uh, checking uh, fishing boats and like that for uh, contraband. And we did take prisoners a couple of times. Um, after I left the uh, USS Constant, I went on uh, USS Kansas City, AOR-3. That was a replenishment oiler. Now we carried avgas, jet fuel, distillate fuel, uh, black oil, ammunition, refrigerated and dry stores. And we replenished all the other ships that was on the line up in uh, the Gulf of Tonkin. And uh, we, they come alongside, we refuel them, send them more ammunition, groceries, everything that was needed. After I left the uh, USS Kansas City, I went to uh, what was called the Development and Training Center Fleet Maintenance Assistance Group in uh, San Diego. Uh, we worked uh, do making repairs on uh, helping repair ships that were in port. And when that tour of duty was up, I went to Assault Craft Unit 1 in uh, Coronado, California. That's uh, right outside of San Diego. And while I was uh, with Assault Craft Unit 1, I participated in the uh, Anna Weetalk cleanup project. Anna Weetalk was an atoll in the Marshall Islands. It was a strategic point during World War II. Uh, the Japanese had captured it first, and we captured it from the Japanese. And after we captured it, <clears throat> uh, it was used as a staging area for the convoys that was heading on into Japan and in there. And then after the war was over, all the inhabitants of Anawitok was uh, taken off, and it was used as an atomic test site. And it was at uh, Anawitok where the Anna United States exploded its first uh, hydrogen bomb. Mm. And then in the 1960s, uh, the nuclear testing program was discontinued, and we talked, set uh, completely, uh, completely deserted until in the mid 70s, when it was decided that the uh, inhabitants uh, should be moved back to their own islands. But uh, before they could be moved back, it had to be cleaned up, mm -hmm. and so I was over there during the, the nuclear cleanup. Uh, after I finished my tour of duty with Assault Craft Unit 1, I went to the Fleet, Fleet Training Center in uh, San Diego. Uh, I was an instructor there. I taught the Navy's uh, maintenance, material maintenance uh, course. And it was there, while well, I was there that I had my 20 years in and I retired. 
And this, what year was this when you retired then? 1984. And something else I'd like to mention, uh, I think would be of interest. Three of my uh, children have been in uniform. Really? Uh, my oldest son, he's got over 20 years in the Coast Guard now. Uh, Honorable. I have a daughter who served in the Navy and she was on the first ship that uh, was in the Persian Gulf whenever Operation Iraqi Freedom started. Really? Yes, and then also uh, I had another son. Uh, <clears throat> uh, he, was, he was in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. He was, he, 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 he was killed in Iraq in 2004. I heard his story, Carl. Yeah, the bridge over in East Brady was named after him. So, what was your name? Sean Curley. And how long have you been in the service so far? Uh, about uh, two years, almost two and a half, I believe. Yeah, branch? Air Force. What was your training so far? Um, so far, I've went through uh, basic military training, and then uh, I've been training up in Coriopolis, for my job, which is aircraft electrical and environmental specialist. Um, for right now, uh, I'm just waiting till I can get all the training done and then deploy. Uh, after that, um, over the next few years, probably, uh, I know I have to deploy once a year, which is definitely something I look forward to. <laughs> it's hopefully gonna be a lot of fun. But um, I am gonna go through this contract and by then I'll have my pilot's license and um, probably decide if I would like to become a pilot in the Air Force or just be civilian. Civilian? Mm -hmm. Now what do you want to fly? Do you have any ideas that you want to fly with a pilot's license? Um, for right now, just because it takes a little while to get the hours, I, I just, I want to get my own aircraft, like a small Cessna or anything like that, mm -hmm. and uh, fly cross country kind of stuff. And then long term, for sure, definitely work in an airline. I guess the best thing would be like a 747, like 100% get one of them, the big career kind of jobs. I had an image of that, what a 747 is, because I, I don't know what that is myself. I'll look it up later. <laughs> Talk about your class and where you've been at, especially. How long, how long have you been in your class so far? Any marksmanship? Um, well, well, during BMT, uh, two months down there uh, in Texas, uh, ended up with honor graduate and expert marksman. Really? Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Um, you definitely, you definitely experience a lot just like in that like little amount of two months. You definitely get to see a lot of the diversity in people and how it can still work even though it doesn't make any sense. Because there were a lot of times like, especially with sixty something guys in one place, it's just a bunch of children. So it's. Definitely interesting to see how everyone can work together. I don't suspect for too much longer. Um, I, I'll be getting my training done hopefully by uh, just before the middle of next year. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I will either deploy at the end of next year or in the middle of next year. Um, that'll that can last anywhere from like two to four months. Uh, kind of. What's lucky for me is I, I do get a say in like some parts of my deployments. I don't get to say where I go and like that, but I um, they sometimes take people who actually want to stay there longer because they always need the help. Um, I, I do get the choice of being able to stay there longer, which is cool. I might do that, get to experience a little more. All right, well, my name is Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell, so I was, I was here. I'm from Shapora. I lived here most of my life. Uh, I, was, I served in the U.S. Navy from 1976 to 70 to 80. Uh, and the National Guard? Oh yeah, the National Guard from 86 to 2001, or 84 to 2001, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And you retired from the National, National Guard. Guard. That group too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, when I retired from the Guard, I would have been 50, yeah, I think 50, 50. 50, 50 you were done. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I think before 40, I think it's locked in after 50. Because Bradley, Bradley's 19, so. Bradley's like four there. 40, 45, 50. Yeah, I don't like That's a picture of. Matt, you're back. Start with your dad. All right. Start with your dad. Your dad. My dad, he sure did. He was in the Air Force from Wild Campbell. He was in the Air Force. Yeah. Here's a. Well, that's just a true picture of general. That's there not. he is. Yeah. He served in the Air Force from 48 to 50. Cool. All right. Mm. And he's a native of Shakur. He's also a native of Shakur. He's passed away since. Yes. Yes. Since then. Yes. yes. He passed away 10 years ago. And that's my grandson. That's a He's sir, currently serving in the U.S. Army. Now, where is he from? He is from Butler. Butler. Oh, Butler. Area. Okay. Because I'm like, I think I recognize that guy. I don't know. I don't know everyone from Butler. Well, I don't know about in the past. Yeah, Bradley Shirley. Mm -hmm. Bradley Shirley. If you see Brandon up here, or they call him ears up here to these, it's his son. I know. Yeah. And they look exactly alike. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's currently serving in the U.S. Army right now in Korea. Really? Yeah. yeah he just went to Korea. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Wish we would have had him here. I probably would have waited maybe another week. I probably would have seen him then. Would he be home for the holidays? No. no. He won't He's be here for nine months. Yeah, yeah he was here yeah. in September. And my great great grandfather. Really now? McCullough. Yeah. Samuel Wallace McCullough. He served in the Civil War, fought in the battles of Chancellorsville and Antietam. Antietam? Yeah, he was in from 61 to 63. 18, that is. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Everything. He was also from Shakur. Thank you for coming out today. Yes. Did they treat you to breakfast today? What? Did they treat you to breakfast today? No, I'm not a vet. What's your name, sir? My name is Richard Stryker. Richard Stryker. And who was your brother, sir? Herbert L. Stryker. How long has your brother served in the military? How, how long? About 18 months. Really? Yes. Tell me about your brother. All right. He was in the high school when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. He wanted to join the Marines, but he was too young. So. Uh, mother wouldn't sign for him, of course. So he waited till he graduated. He was drafted into the 26th Division. That's the Yankee Division. And uh, it was uh, it was a good outfit. I mean, you can't knock the 26. But it wasn't a combat unit. It was a occupation troops. When the fighting men took the city, the 26 would go in and hold it, you know. And uh, there was a letter in the local paper that said, join the 26th Division and relieve a whack for overseas duty. And that sort of made him angry. So they was just starting to form the 5th Ranger Battalion. And he uh, volunteered for that. And uh, he come up through the ranks pretty good. Well, he was only in, like you say, 18 months. And uh, they trained uh, all over the Eastern Park, different places that they trained for amphibious landings and stuff. Then they went to Scotland. and. Uh, can I take this off? You're welcome to take it off, sir. I'll keep mine on. I was good. I, I don't hear good, and I can't breathe good see this. All's good, I understand. I was about to say, all's good. And anyhow, they, uh, he went to Scotland, and they trained with the uh, commandos. Mm -hmm. they, they scaled the White Cliffs of Dover, climbed up them, and that, that had a purpose. When the, when the invasion came, now my brother was injured in an accident. Uh, a mortar shell exploded. He was a he he was a mortar. Uh, what do you call it? 
the fire of the mortars. Anyhow, one blew up and he was wounded in the face, chest, and arms. The doctors gave him five days to live. And uh, he recuperated from that. Instead of being sent home, he volunteered to join, rejoin his troops. I still have the letter that he sent to his general, or the head of the Rangers request him to be uh, reunited with his unit. And he, he was granted that. We didn't know this at home. We knew there was something wrong because of, we only got a couple of letters and somebody else wrote them. You could tell that. And uh, anyhow, he, he had wrote to my cousin he says, I do not want to come home. He says, nobody's going to recognize me because his face was pretty well. But anyhow, he was reinstated and uh, his outfit, the fifth ranger, the second ranger landed on the beaches in Normandy. The fifth ranger went around it was a steep cliff. Now here's where the training came in. They fired grafting hooks. And when they hooked in, they climbed up over this uh, cliff. And uh, the Germans spotted them and they were shooting them when they was coming up. So my brother missed that. But anyhow, the reason they did that, there was five big guns in the back uh, that hadn't taken part in the, the firing and they disarmed them five big guns. They had a special thing. Uh, when you open the chamber of the, this big gun, they put this in and then they closed it. It got hot and it melted. And it disarmed on five cannons and guns. But anyhow, he missed that. He, he caught up with them just before the Battle of Brest, Brest, France. And uh, that uh, town was protected by two big pillboxes. Town was had these two big pillboxes. And uh, there was the walls of it was five foot thick, and they uh, put a charge. Some men crawled up, put a charge on, and uh, then they crawled back to the lines. And when the charge went up, it didn't do anything. It made a loud noise, but it didn't stop them. So my brother and two other. Rangers volunteered to put a bigger charge on it. So they crawled, <clears throat> crawled up and put this charge on. It, it, it was terrific, terrific uh, amount. And they got it set. When they was crawling back to their lines, the Germans knew that there was a big bomb. Later on, they, they thought it was a they pawned bomb, and they fired everything they could. I, I forget how many hundreds of rounds. And when my brother was crawling back to the lines, he, the letter we got stated that he took a direct hit with a mortar shell in the middle of his back. So uh, he, he died uh, instantly. And. The other two that was with them, one other one was killed, and the other one was wounded. And uh, we got a letter back from uh, the War Department of his bravery and everything. And everybody said, boy, he, he must have got the distinguished medal. I mean, none of the Rangers, they'd all have to get that because that's what they was for. They spearheaded the drives, 
and uh, they had a saying, uh, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. So uh, that's, about, that's about the end of it. He was killed on September 17th, two days after his 21st birthday. So that's the end of the story. And, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of him. George, Andrew, Earthlink, B R O S E N I T S C H. I was in from 1955 to 1959. We had a lot of alerts and field problems in Germany. Now, what was your experience with the Green Beret? That's uh, everyone says. I had to talk to the Green Beret. You know, you're, you're the guy. They said nothing special. Um, with a team of men, there were seven men in the team. The weapons expert, demolitions expert, radio repairman, radio operator, demolition specialist, and a medic, and a sergeant in charge, and an officer. In charge of the I'm just recording. I'm just recording, just so I can hear you. So that we would cross train uh, during the week. We would learn the other person's job in, in case something happened. Mm -hmm. I can tell you now, back then I couldn't say anything, but in case there was a war, we were supposed to both jump into Bulgaria. See this, see that big bag there? That's what you pack your shoot in. Which after you, Once you were done. Yeah. Because when you were out of it, you couldn't pack it up the same way it was before, right? No. Never could. No, they have riggers that pack the chutes. They're special trains. There's a guy that just landed. There's a German band. Stunning. You took all these here too. Yeah. Somebody took this. This is me. That's you that, there. That's when I was in Fort Bury. Which they don't want to call it Fort Bragg anymore. Really not. <laughs> that might be a future project, so. These Please. are some of the field problems we were on. You weren't allowed to fish, but the, one of the guys caught some fish in one of the German streams. You weren't allowed to. to. He's still like, I might as well. Okay. 
compared to probably isn't very interesting to you, I guess. Oh, no, no, no. We got, left Germany and we traveled up the Rhine River and we went to France on a problem. Doc, don't say this isn't interesting. This is the whole reason I'm here. This is awesome. So that's a great one there too. Here's some of the guys sitting around relaxing at night. And when we were up there, I made this kite because we were didn't have much to do. And everybody flew the kite, they had a good time with that kite. <laughs> now here, here's a guy. This is a, a GP bag. It's attached to your body. Push that out first, and then you jump. And when you hit, this hits the ground, and that's got your supplies in it. There's more kite work. Do you remember these buddies here too? Did you yeah, kept up with these gentlemen? They were in our outfit, but they weren't on our team. So we didn't make Get to know them. Um, this is the plane we jumped out of. It's called an otter. They took the seats out. We sat on the floor, five guys at a time. They took us up. And we just scared out the door. This is when we flying back and we flew over Paris. Oh, wow. Some pictures of the Eiffel Tower. And that, that's one of them. I took it out of another airplane. Mm -hmm. And this, this is an X rated picture of it. <laughs> 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 That's it, somebody snapped that when I was taking a bath in, in the, the summer in the German stream. Now this has a lot of artwork on it. Do you maybe remember when you got this whole book? Was this a gift? No, I bought this album over in Germany. This whole album here? Yeah. It was in a lot better shape then. <laughs> a couple years of abuse, of course. And that's what happens. Well, funny thing, I'd like to thank you for your time coming in, especially. Okay. And sharing those images with you, I guess, one last time. You, you served for four years, correct? Thank you for your service, sir, if anything. Today's, today's the okay. 79th anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day, and yeah. Vic being gone too, so. Thank you for your time and what you've offered them to, and I, I'll keep you up to date with Cindy. She'll have everything. My name's Ken Malinak. Ken Malinak? Right. M-A-L-I-N-A-K. I was in 63 to 65 in the Army. Malinak, I'm sorry. I'm the M-A-L-I-N-A-K. Thank you. You, sir? I'm John Rodeberger. Rodeberger. R H O D A. Make sure you get B E R G E R. Right. He, he's one of the big weights from the service. I was just a little flunky. B E R. B E R G E R. Yes. Rode Burger. I was getting paid to turn the flight time in one time. I said to the girl working finance, I said, she said, how do you spell it? I said, first half of rhododendron, last half of hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> so, but she gets it. So she goes, Jess, I got, oh, what is that? It's John, rhododendron hamburger. <laughs> just, you know, I was just being a smart ass. You know, Did she like, get right back to you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I had a hell of a time. I had to get that check can, canceled, you know, and I had to go see the finance officer. Mm -hmm. And I, I, was, I jumped through the goddamn hoops. But you did part of yourself. Yeah, I, I walked on the That's a story. Yeah. <laughs>
But I was just being a wise ass, you know. Yeah, I still yeah. am. I'm an old codger, but I'm still a wise ass. They, they just call you Butson, all right? Yeah. Just Butch. That was my nickname, yeah. You know? I got gotcha. you. Dog. Old Dale. Dale Karenbauer. Yeah. You remember Dale? Yeah. From Herman? Yeah. Jim and Dean Snow were at St. Mary's Herman, but we wife and I used to take vacation. In fact, we went, as long as they were running, we made a trip with them every year. So we did Butler Motor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, That's the bus line. That was the bus company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dale said to me, first year, he said, hey, Butch, that's all. Because we were scouts together. My brother Bob was the scoutmaster. And, uh, <coughs> he said, you won't be offended if I call you Bush because he said, my damn, I cannot remember John. <laughs> but he said, all I ever knew you was a Bush. And I had a, I was like Bush Gall. Yeah. He had a Bush yeah. Gall on the south side. Yeah. He had a nameplate on his front bumper, Bush. Yeah. So I had one on mine. Bush. I wish I knew you were a Bush. You know. yeah, a lot of people didn't know what my first name was. You know. But, uh, well, I was always called Lau. I was never called Ken. It was Lau, Lau, L A L. Because when I was a baby, that's how my mom said I cried. Lau, Lau, Lau. So they just nicknamed Lau. Yeah, it's just nicknamed. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, you know, I played every sport there was. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I was a pretty, pretty good athlete, you know, all the way around. So. But that's stayed with me. Still, a lot of people still even up today. Wow. Yeah, a lot of them from Rymersburg because I was born in Rymersburg. Did you know? Well, did you know uh, Art Golda? Yeah. 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 I didn't know. I worked with the guy for gosh, I don't know how many years in the left shop at home. Yeah. Didn't know he was a twin. Yeah. yeah. You know. And somebody told me a few years ago. They said, "Oh hell, you mean?" Uh, the Caldwell twins. I said, <laughs> I worked with Art, but I said, I didn't know he had a twin. He never said anything about having a brother. So he did, you know? Well, yeah. Uh, there he had a twin brother. His twin brother, I think, worked at Cookie Company. Yeah. And Ryan Burke. Uh, what the hell was the name of that? Oh, boy. Ty Ben White retired there. I can't say the name of it. Uh, middle Company. It, they still sell them. Yeah, yeah, they, I think his brother worked there. Yeah, they still sell those cookies too. Yeah. Yeah. Can't think of the name of them. So, a lot of us on now is we have a lot. We have a big veteran society now, and just kind of like, kind of like an interesting thing because obviously we're gonna see this one day and ask like, why are we each wearing masks here? What are each opinions on what's going on now? You said mentioned it before. It is a very serious thing right now. It is to me. Yeah, I, I think. It's here to stay. You never hate with all these vaccines coming out. It'll curtail it a little bit, but it's going to be like the flu. It's In my there. opinion, it's going to be here forever, forever. And I mean, you know, these people say it's a hoax, and this they're full of shit. <laughs> they're perfectly <laughs> honest. You know, yeah, I'm old. I, I said, I, it's well, I am. I'm going to be 81 next week. Yeah, but I'm in super shape. You're in great shape for 81, I'll tell you that. I still right. train six days a week. That's good so, for you. No, yeah. that's good. But I've got a pacemaker. Well, I had 10 operations around the heart 12 years ago. I should, if I wasn't in good shape, I wouldn't be here to this day. So I'm thankful every, every day. You know? But for these people to think it's a hoax and there's nothing there, shame on them. Just totally shame on them. Hey, I said, if they beat this here, the virus that they got now, mm -hmm. China will come up with another one. That's well, a lot of people are saying that too. Yeah, I, I don't know if, if, if you research out a little bit on it, it didn't come from China, it came from Europe. So, you know, uh, well, I've seen something about yeah, that. Yeah, they said it come from Europe more than Well, I don't either. Yeah, I you mean, you, you can't believe nothing on Facebook no. or the computer anyway. No. They're finally telling me that more and more. Yeah. They're going to start trying to keep it in more. I said what should be 
they want to get even with this year, Facebook and all that. Hey, I'm lucky I can work with God damn flip phone. <laughs> You're like me, I <laughs> I can I can get my messages off. Well, yeah, so, I don't yeah, I don't you know, use mine hardly at all. I, because my, I have a niece, well she's dead now, that worked in the hospital in Massachusetts, and uh, my daughter gets phone to see me at the hospital, and mm -hmm. it was an open Facebook block, Facebook block. They're the main and I think it was machinery and I, you know. My daughter, my niece calls me one evening and she said, Uncle John, what's the matter? And I said, she said, are you all right? I said, yeah, well, good to talk to you, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, because she's up here in Massachusetts, you know that. They're the meanest people in the world. <laughs> really, up in that area. Terrible. I mean, I got a son in Maine, so we go up there three, four times a year to see Canada. I hate to stop in Massachusetts. All's good. You talking about your father today? Did you serve it all to yourself, sir? No, I did not. You feel it was all your father today? Yeah. What we'll do it. Who's your father's name? William Klingen Smith. William Klingen Smith. Can you spell the last name? I'm sorry. Okay. C L I N G E N S M I T H. How long did your father serve from, sir? Served a year. You just served a year? And how long yeah. was this? Served in uh, Korea. Right at the start of the end of World War II, into the Korean War, he served in the DMV. How long did he, he saw action then, by the sounds of he served for a year? No, he just, they, they were in the DMV zone. They set it up. They set it up on that side? Yeah. Well, sir, during that year, was he drafted or he enlisted for a short time? He uh, enlisted. He enlisted? Mm-hmm. Which is sort of I've heard for someone to serve, to enlist then. I guess it was kind of relieving. You didn't see any action then, too. No, him and, a couple, him and a couple of his friends decided uh, they were going to do it, so they did it. They decided to? Yeah. Kind of relieving then. You see, it's just a short, short amount of time and you didn't see too much then. I'd say this mm. anything lucky. Nah, he said he wouldn't talk about it though. He wouldn't talk about it much. Nah, it wasn't that you hear a lot about that? Yeah, he wouldn't. He wouldn't come into it or say anything about it. You'd ask him, and he'd just say, "I just don't want to talk about it." He doesn't want to bring it up. Yeah. Do you think there's ever times where he spoke with other Korean vets that he would open well, up? Well, there was times when he got a little bit old. When he got up into his eighties, he would you know ask him a question, and he'd him haul around, and he'd tell you what happened. You know, but. Just when we were younger, he wouldn't say anything. Anything about it? No. Nah. How old was your father when he was, when he did enlist? Oh God. You think it was maybe eighteen, nineteen? Oh, seventeen, eighteen. Really young, young guy. Really young then. Yeah. Really young guy. He he lived in Shakur all his life. This uh, area. He was born in yeah. He lived in Goose Town. Really. Which is right out the road here. Mm. And then he met my met my mom, and. uh I grew up on Central Avenue in a house down there that my granddad, you. you're welcome, a house that my mom's grew up in. Mm -hmm. And I left, gosh, 77, I think it was. I went to Florida, got married, and moved to Florida and then Tennessee. And uh, my mom passed away and one day he called me and me and him talked every night after my mom passed. And then one day he called and he said, uh, Hey, buddy, can you come home? Mm. He said, nobody will do anything for me. I said, let me check into it, Dad, and I'll let you know. And so I did, and I told him, I said, I'll see you June 29th, Dad. No, make that earlier. I'll see you in June. So I got here. Two weeks later, he passed away. July 30th, he passed away. I've been home. I've been here for three years now. Three years now. Yeah, and I'm buying the house I grew up in. He didn't want it to. He didn't want it. He didn't want it to leave the family. It's honorable. Thank you. So, I'm doing what he wanted. 
That's all I know. I think it's important to document these stories, you know what I mean? Because folks, that's what's really hard. We had Vic Guy will pass away, and we don't have any of these stories of him recorded, you know? Yeah. That's just so valuable. And uh, he was president of the fire company and for years. And just a big influential member. Yeah. Good guy. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, say about what, what do you want me to say about my dad? <laughs> you know, come on. I said, you know, he was a nice guy. I said, discipline when we needed it, non discipline when we didn't need it. I understand. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. That's like all of us. You know, sometimes we need a little bit of <laughs> to help us along. You know, and other times you just needed something for him to say something. Thank you. No, I mean, that, I mean, that's perfect. Thank you. You told that story great. No, thank you for your time. What was your name, sir? I'm sorry. Dave. Dave, same yeah. name? Thing as Smith? Same last name. Yeah. Will do. Yeah. Thank you for coming in today. You're welcome to wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask. But everyone's going to be fine. I'm going to keep mine on. Because I'm also a, res I'm a restaurant worker. I work oh. at Cindy's. But I have worked in the public. And I'm, I'm a bartender. I'm off school. All's good. The other one's fine. As long as I think one of us have something on, then oh. we're fine. You know what I mean? So. Uh, Harry E. Wiles. But Eugene is my middle name. That's what I've been going with since I... They call me Gene. Eugene. Your family all calls you Gene. Yeah. yeah. And my dad's name was Harry, so he kept us separated. So they, I would, they gave him went by my middle name, and that's what they, my parents. So today, folks just like to call you Gene. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Just G E N E. Yeah. Good deal, sir. I'll call you Gene from now on, too. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right, Gene, how long did you serve then, sir? Two years. You did two years in what branch? Army. You did two branches in the Army? How long did you serve then, sir? Two years. You mean... Uh, well, what what years, excuse me, what years? Well, what years back in, uh, let's see, 60, uh, 65 to 67. There we go. If, I, if I'm correct, this is just Vietnam. Vietnam. This just started Vietnam. Were you drafted in or were I, you chose you? I was drafted. I was drafted. You were drafted. Yes. And I was in the Signal Corps. You were the first gentleman that I was able to interview who was drafted into the military. You were the first you were the first guy I was able to meet. Everyone else was all voluntary who enlisted. Enlisted, yeah. Or when you were drafted, what were your thoughts on that? How old were you when you were drafted? Uh I was twenty. Twenty-two, I believe. In 1965, you're 22 years old. And I made, yeah. I was born in 44. <laughs> 44. You were 22, just turning 23. Yeah. Then and you were going on 23. Yeah. Now, yeah. I was looking for a gentleman like you because I haven't spoke with anyone yet that was drafted yet. So that's. Okay. It's great to hear. Thank you. Born. Well, 1965, when you're drafted in, where were the first steps to get back into the military then? What was the what? Where were your first steps to being drafted? You were enlisted, and you were sprouting the boot camp. Where'd you have to go first then? Oh, Fort Hamilton, uh, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Fort... Uh, Georgia, Fort Gordon, Georgia is where I went to do basic then. It's been so long ago. It's been so long. I, I, I completely <laughs> understand if you don't remember then. <laughs> <laughs> now you do, were you, you were shipped off to Vietnam. How long did it take to be shipped to Vietnam? Well, I uh, flew over, well, it was, uh, six months. It was six months I, of training. I took my military, uh, my basic training at Fort Gordon, Georgia, in my, my uh, advanced adventure, AIT was in Signal Corps, mm -hmm. you know, in the Signal, and then uh, that was in 67, and uh, so, or 65. It was in 65. Yeah, and I spent, uh, well, six months in Georgia with the, military, the basic and you know, advanced infantry training. The, uh, I was in Signal Corps, mm -hmm. and I was a radio operator, 
And uh, then I was shipped to Germany, and I spent 18 months over there. Yeah. If, uh, I had him in Vietnam mm -hmm. at that time. I might have, you know, taken another three or four years, but uh, you've seen combat. But I didn't. I, I just didn't want to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. With uh, even at back then, how bad it was, it was going on, but it wasn't. Uh, well, I don't know how. I mean, it was from war, but I don't know how, how intense it was at that time. But you said you were a radio operator, operator yeah. sir. And during that time in Germany as a radio operator, you tell me a little bit 31 more about that. Thirty-one and twenty was my memo, and, and uh, I was I worked in the, uh, the back of a van. We were in a. It was in everything was enclosed. It was in the back of a pickup truck or uh, doing IT snap. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you just didn't complete, you know, your air radios was just in a very small area, mm -hmm. but uh, that's where they were. And uh, I spent, but then when you go on maneuvers, you had to take the whole thing, set up antennas, you know, and all that good stuff to get communications between your battalions or your companies. And it was pretty interesting, you know. But in Germany, I was there for, like I said, 18 months and got to see a lot of country over there. And the class that graduated ahead of me, the first week ahead of me, all went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In our class, all went to Germany or Europe. Mm -hmm. And my one buddy went to, uh, oh, I can't think of it now, uh, Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. And my uh, Tommy McElhain, he went there and then I went to Germany. And uh, that's where I spent the whole time then over in Germany. Uh, Vietnam kind of like takes over the spotlight during that time of history. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you don't know a lot of like the areas of what's happening, especially. Because I hear a lot of stories from Vietnam and talking about, like, especially their yeah. um, kind of background of where they've been at. But I don't hear a lot of folks like talking about what was German, what was happening in Germany during this time. Well, it wasn't too much of anything. Uh, it, it was pretty quiet. It was after the war. And I was stationed about. Uh, it was about four miles from East Germany, mm -hmm. the border line. At that time, it was still East and West, you know. East and West, it was, it was still no, it was still broken down. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Still divided. Did you cross the border at all? Oh no, no. Mm -hmm. We went to the border just Bro. to check it out, and uh, you, that's as far as you wanted to go at that time. At that time, yeah. you said you're on the west side or the east side. I was on the west side. You were on the west side. Oh yeah, I was in America. And this was the Berlin Wall. Did you call it the Berlin Wall at the time? This yeah, uh, it was yeah, it was there. It was called during that time. Oh yeah, because I know it's just kind of its fame name. You know what I mean? It's just the the quote Berlin Wall. And when you saw it, was it? It was still called that time. It was just a it was just the wall. Well, yeah. Well, actually, when I went to the border, it, it's just uh, they had you couldn't get through. I mean, it was just a, and uh, that's as far as we went and turned around and. Went, Checked it out and got back to our base. <laughs> but actually, the war at that time was pretty much, you know. The, it was concluded. Yeah. There was still a lot of time but, before that was finished, of course. I know Germany was extremely divided. Oh, yeah. During that time in Germany, did you hear any stories about crossing? I know there's a lot of different cases of folks, people crossing the border either side. No, I can't think of uh, any stories like that? Anything like that now? A lot of them I know were very controversial, especially where some a lot of them were even covered up. Yeah. About who was crossing and so many people. I know some. I know some stuff on that. I know some a little bit already there. It's funny. A buck who came in. He was the Green Beret um, uh -huh. Army member. He was in last week, and he talked about his time in Germany just after World War II ended. And he has a lot of different photographs in that area. And it, it's nice because I'm kind of connecting his time period into this time period, which he was there from, I believe, 48 oh. to 40. Uh, actually, no, I think it was done in 50, 1950. Oh. He was there from that time. And he has so many different photographs. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of nice where we're kind of connecting that time from even in 65, where it's a whole different world. But again, Berlin Wall was still a huge issue. Yeah. And that didn't go down until, what was it now? It wasn't 98. Oh my God. I'll have to look that up and 
Bring it into the interview too. Now, what, what was these preppers you brought in? Because nobody else brought this in for me. This is my uh, DD-214. DD-214, this is your synopsis of your time in the military? Well, it's, uh, yeah, because it gives me your, my bat, you know, um, Expert rifle. Yeah. Good conduct medal. Yeah. I believe Des brought in Vic's paperwork in for me, which I do have a photograph of that. Uh, well, one no. of my, my, my granddaughter, she's a, she works out in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And she's a historian. Really? Oh my God, that's... So she went out all my military uniforms and I gave them a tour and they're all out in Gettysburg. Who's, who's your granddaughter? Uh, Carolee Stewart was her maiden, her name. I don't know if she's okay. remarried or not, though. I, I have a friend. I thought it was, I thought it was his friend. I knew a friend that worked out in Gettysburg for the longest uh, time. I'm like, oh man, that was her. I couldn't imagine now. Well, she's been out there, oh, four or five years probably, or maybe more than that now. It's, time goes by so fast. Mm -hmm. But she's a historian, and she, that's all she loved to do is talk about this. Talk about uh, his history, you know. Can I? May I? Am I allowed to see it at least? I won't. Yeah. yeah don't worry. Yeah, clean just hands. my. Yeah. This is badge. Short rifle, sharpshooter, marksman, St. Louis, Missouri. Catanning, Pennsylvania. We spent a lot of time on the rifle range. Now you lived in Catanning your whole life. You were born in Catanning. Well, no, no. Well, yeah. Raised Catanning Hollow. Mm -hmm. Over in East, you know, because I knew all that East Brady area there. Yeah. Uh, that's where I was born and raised. Born and raised. And I've been living now, well, over here in uh, Shrew Creek Township since we've been married. And that's been 50 some years ago. 50 some years. <laughs> yeah. True. We were married you. in 67. Congrats. And uh, that we've been yeah, together since. Just as you were dying, you married in 67. I, I was into my military experience on board an aircraft carrier. We had a, an airplane come in, crash landed on the flight deck, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was a flight deck worker. It was part of my military job, but. Uh, we was fighting fire, which was not <laughs> on sea, right? Yeah, not what we were supposed to be doing. But from that time on, I had a pretty good interest in. Geez, you know, we can. You got to do something. So when I went over to Inspector Coppers at the time, they I said to them, "We don't have a fire brigade. We have nothing, and we're in a chemical plant." They said, "Well." <clears throat> we don't have nobody to do it. Well, another young man, myself, said, we'll do it for you. We'll run it for you and get you started. So David Slater from Hamilton and myself jumped in and took over and started being the fire brigade at, at Coppers. And uh, from there on it just grew. Well, then they put me in the safety department at Coppers, and uh, I, I said to them, well, if I'm going to teach firefighting and do firefighting, I want to go learn it. I want to I want to travel around and figure out what I'm doing it the right way, which they was all happy for that. So I traveled all over the United States mm -hmm. learning how to do things right. <laughs> so I basically... That's how I got my start in that. But, uh, when in in 1970, whenever I was uh, over there, Butler Community College called me and said, "You know, hey, would you like to teach for us?" And I said, "Well, sure, I'll teach for you guys." So I went to work for BC3. <laughs> how long ago was this? Uh, this was in. Oh boy, now you're asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been probably 76 or 77. 
from 77. It's funny because you don't hear those stories of who taught at BC3. Because you, you don't realize how many people can teach at BC3, especially. Yeah. It's, it's a community college still, so you don't have to have any large, crazy credentials to be able to teach there as a professor, too. Were you regarded as a professor then because you were all fire safety? <laughs> no, some of them did. Some of them called me professor. I said, I ain't no professor. I'm just a <laughs> firefighter. You had the experience. You yeah, had the experience. I'm, I'm just a firefighter. Right? Some say that's more valuable than lessons. I think it is. I think experience is, goes a long way. So you yeah. said like it only took one plane crash and just, it was a destroyer, did you say? No, it was an aircraft carrier. It was an aircraft carrier. What Do you remember the name of that carrier itself? Really, Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk. Mm -hmm. Can you spell it? I'm very sorry. K-I-T-T-Y. Really? H-A-W-K. I didn't think it was going to be like that. I was thinking something different. Not Kitty, like Cat Hawk. <laughs> Not Kitty Hawk. Here we go. <clears throat> that it was a... It was a... It's decommissioned now, but it was a big in Vietnam. I mean, we, During that time. We spent whew, many days at sea over there. We we got accommodations. Ooh, what the hell was it? 90, 90 days at sea without going to land. Mm. But uh, it, it was just it just actually blurred. <laughs> it blurred from one to the other, and boom. But I was supposedly a structural mechanic, aviation structural mechanic was my military specialty with a secondary of parachute rigor. So I got to do a lot of good things that I enjoyed. That uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I wouldn't trade my military time for nothing. For anything. I hated it then. I hated it with a passion then, but, but uh, when it was behind me, I thought, boy, you know, man, I saw three corners of the world, you know, and, and got a hell of an education. And it's just a good place to, you know, to grow up from. When you enlisted in 1965, how old were you then? Right out of high school. Right out of high school. 18, 17 years old. 18, just just turning 18. Yeah, they was, <laughs> it, it was uh, the day you turned 18, you was gonna get drafted. And you were in, in the time. <laughs> and you was going, you was going somewhere and I said, no, I don't wanna do that. Well, I wanna, I wanna pick and choose what I can do. It was more willingly if you chose in versus getting yeah, drafted. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, you did four years instead of, too, but I was guaranteed an A school, mm -hmm. which put me into a structural mechanic. And uh, so, you know, if you figure all the, the schooling and stuff you got, the extra two years, you actually spent about a year of that getting educated. Mm -hmm. So you actually only did more, a, a year more than, than what the draftees did. And, uh, it made it made it worthwhile to me. It did anyhow during that time. And I was I was fresh, newly married, <laughs> and uh, I I knew I was gonna get drafted. And I thought, nah, I'll pick and choose what I want. Maybe just maybe I won't won't go to Vietnam, but. As luck would have it, I went to Vietnam anyhow. <laughs> you stepped land on Vietnam? Huh? You stepped on Vietnam? I, I stepped on Vietnam, yes, but I'm not considered to have stepped on Vietnam. I'm a brown water sailor, or blue water sailor. Mm -hmm. but, uh, being as I was in Airedale, in aviation, if we had a plane go down in country, they helicoptered us in to work on it, get it up and get it back to the base, and get it back to the carrier. So, a lot of times we went in, didn't go in, I was in country probably four different days, four different times, and usually it was two, three hours, four hours at the most. But uh, I said, what they would do is if the plane was shot down or, or went down, 
and they could make it to a Marine base or, or a, an Air Force base, that's where they flew in and landed. So then we went into that base, landed at the base, fixed our airplane, got it to hell back out of the country. But uh, we also lost a couple that was in the Hanoi River and in the drink. But uh, it was it was a different situation. During that time. Yeah. That, uh, Oh, I wanted no parts of I wanted no parts of what some of them ground pounders was going through. <laughs> no, I, I respect them a whole hundred percent. You think it was better to just pick the Navy? Oh, by over oh, it. By, oh, by a long shot. <laughs> by a long shot. So my dad says he almost went Marines. He had that option with Marines when he was enlisting. He was either like, oh, uh, Marines, I'd be less than within eight weeks or so processing, but Navy would take him that day if he went in to talk to him and he was stuck with Navy and he was happy with it, so. That, that's the way, when, uh, I, I laughed, I'll never forget the day I went to Pittsburgh. Left out of Catan and went down on a bus to Pittsburgh. The federal building and we got in there and they were just running people through, screaming mm -hmm. and hollering and yelling. Lined, you know, lined us up against the wall line up here and line up there. All of a sudden they all, all right, you guys start counting. Count by fours. These guys counted by fours. He said, okay, you guys remember your number. You guys count by fives. So these guys counted by fives. So I'm thinking, what the hell, four on that side, five on this side. And there was probably 20 of us standing back here that didn't, didn't get in the magic lines. <laughs> but, uh, all right, all you number ones, both lines, you're going to the Army. All you number twos, you're going to the Air Force. All you number threes, you're going to the Marine Corps. Number fours, you're going to the Navy. And you number fives, you lucked out. You're going to the Coast Guard. That, uh, I'm sitting there in the corner, standing there in the corner, my, in my skivvy sitting there saying, I'm glad I know where I'm going. <laughs> <coughs> you think that work nowadays? Just line up and just see what happens? <laughs> I don't know how they do it nowadays. I don't know how they do it. I, I talked to Cindy's son. He went in here just not too long ago. And uh, I, I kept trying to talk to him about getting in. Uh, he wanted to go into aviation. But, uh, you know, it, it's... What you want, I guess. What you want, not to make of it. But it's fun. It was fun. I went. I got, like I said, I got to see three quarters of the world. I went from went from Great Lakes, Illinois, at boot camp. I went home for ten days, and then they sent me to Lakehurst, New Jersey, and that was parachute rigging school. And I got in parachute rigging school, and I was there about two weeks. And the chief officer called me into the personnel office and he said, Early, you ain't supposed to be here. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, this is what my order said. He said, yeah, but they screwed up. He said, you was guaranteed aviation structural mechanic, so we're gonna, we gotta get you out of here and get you down to Millington, Tennessee to get into that school. So I said, well, what about the schooling I got here? well, you're lucky, it's gonna give you a second MOS. And I said, oh, okay. So I went to Millington and like I said, I was just fresh, freshly married and took my wife down to Millington and we spent, I don't even remember how long we spent there, but it was, it was like 16 weeks or something like that we was in Millington and uh, left Millington and went to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and that was my home base. And uh, Norfolk? No, Norfolk, NAS Oceana. Really? It's right directly behind three miles from Virginia Beach. Not bad. At, uh, I, lived, I lived on Virginia Beach. <laughs> That's luxury. <laughs> yeah. At, uh, Can you imagine Virginia Beach in the 70s at least? 65 in the 70s. It was... Uh, 
it was a nice town. It was, you know, it was, a, it was pretty well laid back. It wasn't quite a tourist destination yet. Well, it was, but it wasn't really it wasn't not what it is not now. Not what it is today, no. No. But, uh, it was it was decent. We had uh, we lived on a little farm. I mean, uh, we was probably from here to I would say downtown, down to Rummy Mark. We was from here to there, out of the town of Virginia Beach, and my landlord had a little mom and pop store, a little general store. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a pig farm, he raised pigs. So we lived right on the pig farm, we lived right beside the pigs. <laughs> but uh, it was, and they was nice people. <clears throat> I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll enjoy being here because you know, I had my wife with me. But they told me, they said, eh, don't get too comfortable. You're going to be overseas before very long. I said, I am. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. You're going to go to VA-42, which was a tactile uh, training squadron. And then you're going to go to either VA-65, 75, or 85. You go to one of those three squadrons, and whatever you draw, then that's your final destination. So I actually, I draw VA-75. And uh, it was a it was a good outfit. I, I went from I laughed. I I went from VA forty two to VA seventy five and was checking in, going through all the bullshit of getting everybody to sign my paperwork. And it was a Friday, and uh, I said to the wife, I said, I'm going home. I'm gonna come home. I'll call you and I'll catch a ride home and I'll bring my car back. She said, okay. So I started hitchhiking home, going out through the Hampton, Ches Chesapeake Bay, bridge and tunnels. I was hitchhiking, ride going home. Old, older gentleman stopped and picked me up. And he said, where are you going, sailor? I looked at him and I said, well, Going up to PA. Yeah. He said, well, so are we. I said, really? And he said, yeah. Said, Where are you going to PA? I said, oh, so just a little wee town. You've never heard of it. He said, well, try me. I said, well, the town's called East Brady. Oh, I think I have heard of East Brady. He said, did you ever hear of New Bethel? I said, yeah. He said, that's where we're going. Him and his wife. So he hauled me the whole goddamn way home. <laughs> Not bad. <clears throat> and and part way out, in the middle of our conversations, I found out he was my commanding officer. <laughs> and here I am going north with no out of bounds shit or nothing. <laughs> but uh, he was a good guy. He said, he said to me, he said, uh, when are you gonna be back? I said, oh, I gotta be back Monday. Monday morning, he said, well, so do I. He said, uh, I'll pick you up on the way back. He said, I'll haul you back. And I said, I was going to drive my car back. But he said, well, he said, you don't want to drive your car back. He said, you don't want to take car down there unless you know how long you're going to be there. And I said, well, I really don't know. I said, I had just checked into the outfit Friday. And that was when he said to me, he said, well, I can pretty much tell you the schedule. He said, I'm the commanding officer. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> but, uh, and I got to fly with him. So it was, uh, it was a good relationship. But he was, he was a nice guy, a real nice guy. Zacharias from New Bethlehem. So it's you know it's a small world. <coughs> yeah, I mean, <coughs> <coughs> hasn't been found these masks on huh? Oh, I wear masks all the time. I got CPAP machine at night, so that's on my day. It is. 
Max doesn't bother me. <laughs> really, I'm used to it. I come from Okay, what do you, how do you want me to? I was good, I guess just kind of like, we'll start from the beginning of this. Okay, you gonna ask me questions, do you want me to rattle on, or what do you want me to do? I guess kind of just tell me where you are, and what brought, I guess kind of what brought you all the way back to Shakura. I want to tell you about your military experience, who your uncle is, what brings you to the, in the, the veteran society now, another gentleman who's sneaking, so. I'll be right here all day, I'll probably mingle around and see everyone, but I'm gonna do this. You mean, okay. it, it, how long, you want me to do this right now, or when, when, when is it going to be good too. Huh? Now it's good too, sir. I mean, I don't have all day. Oh, I'm also. When did your uncle pass away? Pardon me? When did your uncle pass? When did he pass? Mm -hmm. A year ago today. Exactly today. Exactly, yeah. 2019, December the 7th. On Pearl Harbor Day. Yeah. That's kind of one of the reasons we tried to line up today. He's got a religious lined up perfectly for us. Yeah. What was his military background? Military background at the age of seven. Yeah. 17. What is it? 17. When he was 17 years of age, mm -hmm. still wasn't really eligible to be drafted or, or sign up. He wasn't in Kenya. He went on his own down to Pittsburgh and enlisted in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And that day, which was um, December 7th, let me take it in my glasses. It was the 29th of December, right before New Year's. <laughs> he signed up for the duration of the war, which meant that he would serve as long as it took. Okay, there was no two-year enlistment, three-year was duration. Okay, so he was set off, went to Fort um, Camp Lejeune, which is a basic training uh, center for Marines. There he qualified as a uh, sharpshooter and also as a bayonet specialist, okay, in March of that year. Then, uh, soon after graduation from the basic training, he was shipped overseas in the Pacific. And he served there two full years uh, and returned on the 17th of May of 46. So he left his family, no communication, basically, and uh, did not return home until he was finished. He fought in many skirmishes over there. Uh, I sort of have some of the information here. It was all printed out there. Huh? That's convenient. That's convenient having everything written down. That's it too. This is his DP 214 I got. Mm -hmm. Okay, which I did background on it. I did his eulogy here a year ago. Mm -hmm. and, um, but he went to the Pacific after uh, basic training on the 13th of May through the 6th of May of 46. He served during that entire time. Uh, he was in many skirmishes and expeditions, engagements over there, mainly in Okinawa and especially in, uh, I pronounce it, he called it Ruku Island. Mm. Uh, from April 45 through 30th of May, uh, and also participated in the occupation of Japan. So um, he, he had many experiences in fossils. He told me one little story. He did, Uncle Vic here, mm -hmm. and I have 28 years of service here in the military, Thank you. would not relate his experiences in the Army during the Marines. He kept it to himself until probably five years ago. And he started to open up and I could talk to him about some of his experiences. And he kept told me one, he said, I can't never forget this. He became a, a buddy of mine. He said he had a tough time at childhood and did enlist in the Marines like he did. And 
his first day in battle, actual battle, he was killed. Mm. And he said, that was really struck me hard. You know, that here's a fellow that tried and willing to serve his country. He got things put together and he died. That quick. That quickly. So that that had an impact on his on you know his, his, his life sort of. But um, he, he told me many of his stories about uh, fighting in a foxhole, which was so important to him, that he would fight to the end. And uh, he had a number, he said, of his friends that were actually wounded while they were fighting in foxholes in different times during the war. But um, he was a very, you could see by the photo right here, he was a tough individual. He seems steady. Nice, nice looking guy, you know. Uh, he could out, out uh, walk anybody. He had a stride which is twice as probably as anyone else's. <coughs> he, could cover, he could cover ground. <coughs> Thanks for saying. Yeah. So that's Uncle Vic. He. Uh, just a super, super dog. In, in looking back and reflecting back, <coughs> I probably, I, I got involved in the military probably as a result of my uncles mm -hmm. serving the country and willing to give their lives uh, for our country. And <coughs> that probably spun off. And when I went to college at Indiana University, mm -hmm. I joined up in the ROTC program the Roxy program, as it was called, and, and trained there for four years. And then at that time, too, I also trained as a pilot. I was a flight pilot, you know. Really? Sometimes, yeah. And so I um, got commissioned from uh, the university, and then my initial assignment was Korea. I served in Korea uh, as a company commander for over a year in uh, December of 68 to December, pardon me, December of 66 to December of 67. Actually, I came back January of 68. And uh, that was, I have memories of that and night and day of my experiences there. Um, <coughs> and I got released from the Korea assignment, transferred to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I, uh, at that time, made a decision. I was a regular Army commission officer, which I could have continued to serve to be a lifer. But I auctioned out to return home and <coughs> be a teacher. Nice. I had a teacher assignment that opened down here at Chicora Road, so I returned there. So I then immediately signed up for the National Guard. So I served as company commander in different positions in the Guard. <clears throat> then I transferred into the reserve unit and served up till I had to 1993. So I that, that was 28 years plus four years of ROTC was 32 years, consecutive years that I was involved with the military, yeah. <coughs> Which I don't regret. Some of my best friends. I really didn't want to do it, Sean, because I don't really have anything. I was in before the Vietnam War thing really got heated up, so I... Don't have a lot to tell you. <laughs> All's good now. I mean, five minutes. I've had some folks stay for an hour and a half. How long? How that? long? How long did you serve? I just two years. I was drafted. You drafted in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when was this? It was 1959. I was drafted. Are you recording this now? Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> you're good. I'm good. I'm easing into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, probably the most exciting story I have in my own mind is uh, when I dra was drafted, I got a draft card that said to be in Pittsburgh at a certain date at a certain time. And uh, 
to have an overnight bag. So if I had to stay over, I had um, my uh, shaving equipment and everything. So I went to Pittsburgh uh, just expecting to uh, do what they normally do, physical and tests and things like that. Well, at the end of the uh, test and the physical and everything, they marched us into a room and swore us in and they said, uh, you're headed for uh, Fort Jackson. You, when you get up in the morning, you'll be at Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, <laughs> this is a shocker. <laughs> so they, uh, obviously I got on the phone and uh, called people said, you know, I'm not coming home. <laughs> uh, and anyhow, that was quite a exciting moment for me anyhow. And uh, they marched us down to the train station put us on a train and when I woke up in the morning I was in South Carolina and uh, of course as, uh, as you get off the plane there or the train there they uh, you know all of a sudden you're in the army and uh, they want you to march through and get your new clothes and march through and get all your hair cut down and uh, march you to the barracks. And this was an interesting thing. Again, a lot of this is just interesting to me, but uh, we went to what they called uh, Tank Hill in uh, Fort uh, Jackson. And what it was, it was uh, big tents. Uh, the, the sides were wood up to about four feet. Then they were, uh, it was canvas over the top of wood frame and uh, screen doors for the doors. And there were uh, four bunks in there. Uh, no, eight bunks. There were uh, four on each side and uh, that was your place to stay and it didn't make any difference whether it was cold or warm or hot or whatever mm -hmm. uh, and we had a uh, a building that was uh, the shire that everybody shired in uh, and all the uh, facilities were at that building but uh, ours was just a cement floor with two screen doors and uh, unfortunately I have went in the uh, in August and the weather got cold. It was an unusual cold fall and uh, uh, some mornings I get up there'd be uh, snow on the ground. And I don't want to make a big deal out of this because, you know, I always thought, why should I complain? There was guys, uh, you know, went through the wars that were shot at and here I'm just complaining because it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, when I finished my basic training, uh, I was sent to uh, Fort Sill in Oklahoma, which was an artillery uh, group and uh, basically they uh, you know fired rifles but there was an honest John unit that I was assigned to and that was because uh, the uh, it was like a big fire truck and it was a rocket on a uh, rail on the top of the fire truck that they shot the honest John off of, which has been long since discontinued but it had a nuclear warhead on it, and supposedly that mm. warhead was uh, about ten times uh, more explosive than the uh, uh, bombs they dropped in Japan during the war. Worse than Hiroshima, you think? Pardon? Worse than Hiroshima. Y yes, about mm. ten times. We were told. Uh, I, obviously, <laughs> thank heavens I never was around when one of those went off. I'd say. <laughs> so anyhow... Uh, when I left there, they sent me to Hanau, Germany, which was an, basically a, a tank outfit, uh, but uh, I stayed with the Honest John uh, unit, and uh, we used to go out to the field and shoot the rocket, but obviously the uh, warhead was never alarmed. But uh, the scary part was about that was uh, they said that the the rocket could go 12 miles, but the explosion would cover 20 miles. No, oh, Level everything, so <laughs> I said, what the Would it, would it be worth it? <laughs> yeah, what's this deal? A little counterproductive. So anyhow, uh, of course, uh, that's when the United States and uh, the whole world was still watching Russia because they thought that they were going to take over Europe, and uh, there was a uh, mountain gap between uh, Russia and Germany, and it's called Fulta Gap, and that's what the um, our unit was to uh, guard. If the troops come through that, they would shoot the uh, 
the rockets into that to, to uh, uh, eliminate the uh, the Russians. So that was the story. I uh, spent 18 months in Germany. Oh, an interesting thing again uh, was that uh, our commander was a commander by the name of Captain Filer. Captain Filer was an SS trooper during the war, was captured, and at that time they sent some of the uh, prisoners of war to the United States to prison camps. He was sent to the United States. After the war, he got out of the prison camps, married an American girl, and therefore qualified him for the uh, uh, U.S. Army. So he joined the Army again and was uh, commander of our uh, brigade and uh, I was his uh, a jeep driver. So uh, he had a lot of stories. And see, that was in 1960. The war was uh, just over, uh, what, 15 years at that time. So the guys that had stayed in for 20 years, the sergeants uh, were, um, had fought in the war, so they had uh, a lot of animosity towards uh, the captain. They said uh, some of the quotes were that he wouldn't be alive today if I'd have captured him. <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting situation. But anyhow, I spent my time there, and then uh, fortunately he was shipped home before the uh, Vietnam War really uh, heated really up. So then I got out, and uh, that's pretty much my story. Okay. So. Uh, my name's uh, Louis Stoughton. Um, I'm a 1982 uh, Monotol High School graduate, and um, uh, when I was asked to do this interview, I chose doing it on Luciano uh, Plesikov. He was Monotol High School's only war dead, actual combat war dead. Um, Monotol is relatively a new school district. It started in um, first graduating class being 1960. Uh, my mother first made me aware of Luciano Plesikov because he was raised or lived just over the hill from my mother. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting story. Luciano Plesikov was born in Italy in 1947. His father was a Russian soldier, and uh, he was fighting the Germans in the Second World War, and he was captured. Um, somehow he, the, the Italians and... Um, the Germans were, were allies, and uh, he was on a train in, in Italy. Uh, I, I would just purely speculate that it was because he was being forced into a, a labor camp over there. And the train he was on was strafed by an Allied fighter, and it, it caused a big explosion. The train caught on fire. He was able to escape. But the train was hauling cheese, and he, uh, Vassil Plezikov, Luciano's father, told the story on how the cheese melted and it cooled down instantly when it hit the ground, so he grabbed a great big piece of cheese to eat while he made his escape. Somehow, while he was in Italy, he met his wife, and uh, she helped to uh, save his life. Uh, I don't know all the... All the details, but she helped to feed them, and, and uh, they ended up getting married. And they were relocating to Latin America. Uh, I can only speculate that they must have been victims of some sort of discrimination in Italy. You know, here, this Italian girl married to a Russian who was the enemy of the Italians during the Second World War. And somehow their plane ended up landing in Boston, and by mistake or pure coincidence, they ended up staying in the United States. Uh, they first were taken to a camp for Italian immigrants in Renfrew, and then later uh, Sam Muscatello, uh, that owned a bar in Washington Township, Butler County, sponsored them, brought them to Washington Township to Father Marinero's uh, uh, camp for Italian immigrants, which is now the Peaceful Valley Campground. If you go to the Peaceful Valley Campground, you can see this huge uh, memorial or some sort of Catholic wall with some artifacts there where I'm sure they used to worship up there, a uh, beautiful wall that's left up there. But anyway, while well, Luciano was living up there, my, my mother had met him. My mother was seven years older than Luciano, and he was just a kind of man that everyone liked. I never heard a bad word about 
Luciano Plezikov. Uh, and his father was a hard worker, was a carpenter. They bought my wife's uh, grandparents' farm up in um, the top of the hill from Hilliards between Argentine and uh, worked hard. Luciano excelled in sports, football, and track, and had a nice girlfriend while he went there. But uh, since Luciano was born in Italy, he never became a U.S. citizen, and he was just so proud to be from this country that after high school he enlisted in the uh, Marine Corps, uh, graduated from Montauk in 1965. Um, Luciano was killed um, uh, in an ambush in Vietnam, May 3rd, uh, 1967. Uh, have a lot of documentation, first-hand accounts that were there the, the night that Luciano was killed. Um, when the military brought a telegraph to tell that his parents that Luciano was killed, um, they brought it and they said it was like a green military car, and everyone remembers seeing the car. Uh, they went to the high school uh, to tell Luciana's girlfriend, who was a senior at the time, that Luciana was dead. And I've heard different people talking, the screams from his girlfriend, uh, the shrieks, uh, the horror. Uh, anyone that heard that, anyone that was there that day, uh, never forget it. You know, it's just one of those, like, where were you when the towers fell or where were you when JFK was assassinated? It was the same thing when they went back to the high school to tell Luciana's girlfriend that Luciana was killed um, when his mother and this military escort went to get Luciana's brother from Washington Elementary School, that green military car pulled in, and I've heard several people being present. You know, you know, we're talking nine, ten-year-old kids. Uh, when they saw that military car roll into Washington Elementary, uh, Bev Taylor told me Lu Luciana's little brother Vince sat behind her, and he tapped her on the shoulder and pointed out at this Marine getting out of this uh, green government car with this real pristine uniform and said, my brother is one of those, uh, only to find out a few minutes later that his brother was uh, dead. Um, when they were, were brought uh, Luciano's body back to West Sunbury, the young funeral home, there was a mistake because there, uh, the young funeral homes in West Sunbury, PA, there's also a Sunbury, PA, and um, uh, they accidentally sent his body to Sunbury first, and when they finally brought the body back to West Sunbury, Luciana's father wanted to make sure that that was actually him in the casket, and uh, the, the undertaker, uh, Digger Young, said, Mr. Plesikoff, that's a sealed government casket. It's not a good idea to open it, and he said, listen, I saw my parents... <coughs> Murdered on the streets of Russia. I think I can handle seeing my dead son's body. And Digger opened it up, and, and Mr. Plesikoff was able to confirm that was his son inside the uh, casket. But um, Luciana was killed fighting for his adopted country, and he was never a U.S. citizen. After his death, the U.S. government posthumously made uh, Luciano a U.S. citizen. So uh, I, I do have a series of photographs and, and the letters that, that he sent home. So uh, that's pretty much in a nut, nutshell. Now, how did you find discover this story with your family? Now, Luciano knew... But, but it, was, it was through my mother. My mother told stories on him as, when, when he was a child. Um, and uh, she told a story one time how, of course, you know, there's always mean kids and there's always bullies, but they had the road was tarred and chipped. And one of the stories my mother said about Luciano, he, here's this little boy that spoke Italian. He didn't really speak English, or if he spoke any English at all, it would have been broken. And the older boys told him that the, they, they, they rolled up some tar balls and told him it was uh, licorice and he ate it and got deathly ill. And uh, yeah, the, my mother was pretty upset that the older boys did that Luciano. But that's, and then my, my father knew his father and 
It was just the uh, American dream. Uh, these Italian Russian immigrants come to America and work hard and buy a farm and raise a wonderful family. And uh, Luciano, his uh, brother Jim still lives up on the family farm and he, he was a teacher, just done real well in life. And uh, several uh, for the 50th anniversary of Luciano's death, I, I spoke up at West Sunbury and the extended Plesikoff family came while the community honored Luciano. And they took a nice picture, and there were, there, there were like, must have been 30 family members, you know, just starting from a couple, couple, couple immigrants coming to this country, now 30-some, just, just the American dream. And it's, it's just a shame that war takes uh, you know, war, war takes the uh, finest young men in the country. You know, that's 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 the shame. You know, some of the finest men we we have, we buried, you know, on the battlefields. What can you tell me about where Luciano is buried today? I believe it's called the Union Cemetery. It's um, uh, west of 308, just as you leave uh, leaving West Sunbury Borough. Um, it's a half a mile off 308, and uh, the young family they they maintain the cemetery. Now Luciano was a made American citizen after his death and returning home. Right. What do you think your value is? Why we document these stories? You you shared your own you shared your own um, excuse me interviews of veterans who have since now passed away in as little as just four years time. Well. Like I, I referred to earlier, um, the, these men that gave their lives, they're the finest that this country had to offer. And, uh, you know, politics aside, we, we can't ignore what they did. Mm -hmm. They went and paid the ultimate sacrifice. So that's, that's, why, uh, that's why we can't forget them. And, you know, with the way the country is now, with tearing down all of those monuments, you're, they're getting rid of all the history in the school. You know, the, these kids are not going to know anything about their past. So how are they going to move forward properly? They're not. What do you think of the saying that history will repeat itself? How folks say that? I don't know about that one. But I know that I've heard before that every great nation's had its fall and we're the only one that hasn't yet. I could see that happening right now. A lot of times. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there was, there was a lot, there was a, quite a few years that led, pretty sure it was like a good 30 year period until like the finally like the Civil War happened and it lasted just like short of five years. And then there was a lot of things leading up to that. I feel like we're definitely in a period where things are gonna hit the fan fast because it's only getting worse. We're only fighting more. There's not much unity still left. Yep. Is that cut? Did we do it? Oh no, it didn't cut. Ready? Come here, you. Oh, <laughs>